I'm here with uh, Richard Bartle at the Austin Game Developers Conference. Yesterday you just won a Lifetime Achievement Award for your contributions to uh, the online game development world. Um, well, I won a, a, a Legend Award, um, which isn't the same as a Lifetime Achievement because that would kind of suggest I'm not going to achieve anything else. And I'm, <laughs> I'm still optimistic that I might, <laughs> might yet achieve more things, yes. No, it's, a, it's a Legend Award, uh, uh, which is kind of because I'm legend, that, you know, people know I'm from the past, you know, there's this, well, it's sort of historical, but there's these stories about them. some of them are true, some of that, it probably really was a Richard Barton, but, you know, so it's that kind of legend as opposed to, oh my God, there's the current film star of the day, you know, it's, it's a literal legend as opposed to a metaphorical legend, which is um, kind of all right, I guess. So, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Bartle, he uh, created, uh, uh, co-created, one of the first uh, multi-user dungeons, which um, from the for, uh, forefather of uh, massively multiplayer online RPG games of today. And um, could you uh, just uh, summarize a version? I know there's a huge story behind it all, but a, a very short summary of how that all came to be. Well, I, I'd always played games, and I'd always created worlds, and it turned out I was really good at programming. Roy Trubshaw, um, who was the other person involved, um, he was really good at programming. He'd always liked to program. He was really good at systems, and he also wanted to make a world. He, he had this notion of building a, a better place, and so we kind of fit quite well because um, we could both design, we could both program, but our interests were a slightly different balance. So that I, when I needed to to program, I could program, but mainly I could do the design. And when he needed to design, he, he could design, but he mainly was interested in the, the underlying, getting the physics working. So um, what, what, what we, we came up with was, this, was MUD, the multi-user dungeon. And people played MUD, liked it, wrote their own. Some of them were useless, some of them were better. Um, some of the people played the, those games, liked them, and so on. And, and some of them were better, some of them were worse. And, uh, and if you if you want to want the like the um, genealogy, I mean, give me a world, uh, virtual world today, and an MMO today. Just give me one. Um, world of Warcraft. Okay, World of Warcraft. People who wrote World of Warcraft had played EverQuest. They saw it. They liked a lot of it. There were some bits they thought they could do better and did do better. So they wrote World of Warcraft. EverQuest. The people who wrote EverQuest had played a game called Dickumud. They thought there were some things that they could do better than Dickumud mainly the graphics. EverQuest is, it's a straight down the line Dicku mode, except it's got graphics. Now the graphics though is like a huge factor. It's like bringing sand to movies. It's a really big difference. Um, so I'm not trying to diminish EverQuest, but EverQuest gameplay, it's just the same as um, Dicku mode, but with a graphics engine bolted on. Dickumud, where did that come from? Well, the people who played Dickumud have played a game called Abermud from the University of Aberystwyth. Dicku is a data logic institute, Copenhagen University, the Danish. Um, and they played Abermud. And there was actually a schism around that time. Um, a, a whole bunch of people went off and did virtual, what we now call virtual worlds in the sense of there's no game to them. So there were the Lambda movie, things like that. These days it's like Second Life. Um, which meant that the people who were more gamers could, and I, I, I freed from these uh, people who were playing for mainly social type reasons, could go hardcore. And Dickumud went, went hardcore, taking Abermud, which was itself already quite hardcore. Abermud was based on mud, because the, the, the guy who, who wrote it had uh, played mud and thought, I could do the same as that, but better. But mud wasn't based on anything, so that's that's kind of the genealogy. But yeah, today's players of WoW don't even know about EverQuest, let alone about um, Dicku Mud or Upper Mud or Mud. So that's what makes it legendary. It's a dim and <laughs> distant past. So yes, we know it's kind of there, but was it really well? Probably, yes. There are historical notes and allusions to it. But it was there, and yeah. uh, you wrote a book called Design of Virtual Worlds, yes. which, as much as it talks about the design, of these type of games. It also talks a little bit about the history of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I really found profound was that uh, although it's uh, 
we've, we've really improved the graphics, we've really improved the fine-tuned gaming mechanics, mm -hmm. but a lot of the core element ideas are still are still being used as they were in the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yes. Um, the talk I've just given now is, ex is essentially explaining why um, the reason you've got levels in today's MMOs is because Roy and I were um, against the British class system. It's, it's not like left-wing politics, it's this is unfair. When you when you play games, gamers have this sense of fairness and unfairness, and that was unfair. We we were in a in situations where there were people who were breezing past us for, for wealthy careers, uh, guaranteed, and yet Roy and I were having to beat every step of the way, and. It wasn't even to like I mean, Roy and I. At least we had the advantage of being male. I mean, imagine if you were a girl back then; it would be it was even worse. So, we were. Um, many of the systems we put into Mud were there to bring fairness to a virtual world that we perceived wasn't there in the real world. And some of those things are, yeah, are they still valid thirty years on? Probably, but no, not where that was meant. The, the real world's moved on, but they're still in. In the paradigm, well, they shouldn't be in the paradigm. You should take them out. We should um, appropriate them for for new paradigms, and that's what I was ranting about today. I do a good rant. <laughs> I enjoyed that rant, uh, really, because while I was reading this book, uh, it kind of occurred to me that game design, it, it's 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 used for making games, but it's really not about making games. It's about understanding people and about how to make people more happy, how to make things better for them, give them what they really, really want. And you could apply that to other fields as well. You can, yeah. But I mean, game design is, is a very selfish activity. Um, people are designing games because they want to say something and this is their means of articulating what they can say. Um, it's, it's an art form. Um, yes, um, if what you want to say is, look, you guys, you're not worthless. You're, you're, you just need to look at yourselves, and you, you can see how how well your, your your potential. Now, if that's what you want to say, that's kind of what we want. One of the things we were trying to get over is, yeah, well, then these virtual worlds, that's what they're for. But it's not. We were we aren't we weren't doing it to make money or anything. When I mean, we didn't know that there weren't 500 of these things already written out outside the world. We were just doing it because this it was it looked like it's going to be fun because. We, programming is fun for Roy and I and so it's that kind of selfish but it's really we were, we wanted to to say something now if you're creating a world and yes yeah you, you know, we're bringing joy to millions well, if you want to bring joy to millions you, 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 you work for a charity and it's probably a lot more meaningful but if you're a game designer then it's not so much I want to why am I want to, to bring joy it, it's you understand, through design you come to understand more about yourself. For players, it's through play they come to, do, to understand more about themselves. And for some players, they, what they understand is that actually they want to design. Um, they, understand, they, they come to understand more of who they are, and who they are is somebody who wants to express themselves through a game. And uh, through a game, game design, to game development, and everybody who works in a in the games industry wants to be a game designer, everybody. You know, maybe not the producers, I think they're probably experienced enough to know not to be a game, that they don't want to be game designers, they've got their own kind of path. But you know, the play testers, the programmers, the artists, the animators, customer service, everybody wants to be a game designer. Um, so why do we need game designers? Because they can design, and they can actually do it. And the reason they can do it is because they've got something to say. Until you know what, it's not so much till you know what you want to say, it's more if you know how to express what you want to say through a game design. That, if that's your medium, then that's, then that's what you should be doing. If, otherwise, I mean, if I could write down what, what was unfair about the world, then why would I be a game designer? No, I could write it, but I can't write it. It's just, look, just play the game, you'll understand. That's, that's how I'm getting them. My, that's, how I'm articulating my uh, 
my, my view, my, 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 my soul. And the more that, you, that it's done, the more I, I can see why and what I was trying to say, what I was trying to do it. And, and then the next time it's a different one. This is why long-standing designers, you know, people like um, Sid Meier and uh, Peter Molyneux, people like that, they've got an oeuvre. You look at their early games and their later games and they're the same ideas which are kind of um, refined. So you look at Peter Molyneux's games, for example, and they're, they're all uh, god games, and then, and then, but they switch to this good and evil kind of thing, and you know, is it black or white, or is it some kind of thing in between? And, and uh, you think, oh, okay, right, well, nobody but Peter Molyneux could do that, because, uh, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, it's kind of based on um, the, like the, the Jewish world, I don't know if you know Peter Molyneux is Jewish, but, um, but that's something he's sort of working through because of his background. And you think, wow, that's really good. I mean, I don't know if, he's, if he knows or cares about that, but you can see why he's designing things and what he's trying to say. I mean, if you look at um, Mark Jacobs' games um, for MMOs, he's, his is all about conflicts of large, large groups. And, and whether you know what he's saying or, or why he's saying, whether he knows himself, is immaterial. It's just that you, you can see that there's he's saying something there, uh, and this is um, this is important uh, because you know, games are who people are. The best game designers are the ones who are saying something. It's not that oh yeah, this is a game that's fun. I mean, I, 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 I got an email from a student yesterday. I want to do a game. What what, what kind of game does that design? Oh, I just, so I just just there and then game a game design. You know, it's not like it's hard. What's hard is, is a game design which is meaningful, and the more, and that's that's the hard part, and that's where the, the great designers like um, Peter Molyneux, like um, Sid Meier, like um, well, <laughs> anything if you play play the Sims, you know, will write uh, that the great designers have, have all got something to say. Raph Costas. You just know if it's if Rap Costa is going to do a do something, it's going to be sandboxy, free. You can do what you like because that's he likes to. He's, he's like wants to empower people, wants to and, and to um, to give m more people the experience of being free. Of, well, not so much free. It's more more social. It's more, more social. But the thing is, if you can read a game designed like that then you're a game designer. If you can't read a game design like that, but you can still understand it, then then it's um, it doesn't matter whether it's accessible or not. What it matters is that you, 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 you've got something from it. So I might look at a, an, an old master painting and think, wow, that's really cool. Like, I, could, I can imagine that person there being alive. And it's laden with symbolism that's gone completely past me. I don't know whether that lamp's supposed to be God or what. I don't care. It just looks really good. And likewise, yeah, people play a game, but um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. But the reason the old master is appreciated is because if the guy hadn't put all that symbolism and all that meaning in it and just said, well, I know that people like lambs, so I'll draw a few dead lambs and things, you wouldn't have got anything near as consistent or as powerful like that with game design. The more the game designer puts themselves into it, the more the games meaningful.